Greetings, everybody. Welcome to this next invited address. This address is jointly organized by the AMS and the MAA, and they have invited Professor Karen Lang from Wellesley College. Karen got her doctorate from the University of Chicago in 2008 under the supervision of Dennis Hirschfeld and Robert Soar. Before that, she was one of the impressive number of mathematical logicians who have done their undergraduate work at Swarthmore College. And since then, she took a National Science Foundation funded postdoctoral position at Notre Dame University, worked with Peter Cholak and Julia Knight there, and then began her current position at Wellesley College where she's now an assistant professor. She has been a Project Next fellow. Um, she is an organizer of nerds, which maybe we all are, but in her case, that means the New England Recursion and Definability Seminar. We're all very proud of that name. Uh, let's see. Um, and she, she, she and her students at Wellesley have recently authored two different articles in the Math Horizons magazine. And also she herself has two articles, one coming soon, in the notices of the AMS. Um, the article in the current notices is about the subject of this talk. And so if you want at any time, feel free to pull out your laptop and look up that article in this month's notices and follow along. Um, I would encourage you to turn off the sound on your laptop and any other 20th first, 21st century devices you may have. And please welcome Professor Karen Lang. So thanks, Russell, for that very kind introduction. Um, I am very grateful to the AMS and the MAA for the opportunity to share with you the big ideas of my field of computability theory. Uh, though these ideas continue to fascinate me, face, fascinate me every single day, it's the mathematical communities that I belong to, including you know, Project Next, um, the Carleton Summer Math Program, the various departments that I've been, have been fortunate enough to have me uh, that really sustain me. In particular, I want to acknowledge the vibrant and welcoming computability and wider logic communities. You can hear more from these communities um, at the special session that Russell and I are organizing, Logic Facing Outward. Um, I'll tell you more about that session uh, later at the, at the end of this talk. Okay. Finally, I want to thank all the organizers who put together these meetings. Um, it is truly an amazing feat of logistics. So thank you for, for all those efforts. So let's get started. Okay. So mathematical theorems often assert that given a particular scenario or setup, a specified structure exists. So for example, from discrete mathematics, weak, weak Koenig's lemma, well, I'll call weak Koenig's lemma, states that every infinite binary tree has an infinite path. And from algebra, what I'll call, just to give it a name, the prime ideal theorem says that every commutative ring has a prime ideal. So theorems of this form assert the existence of an object, but they don't say anything about how would you actually go find it, right, or, or compute it. So our goal for today is to study two different but related approaches to measuring the difficulty of mathematical problems from that perspective. Throughout, I'm going to use weak Koenig's lemma as a running example, and don't worry, I'll, I'll tell you what it really means, okay? Um, and, uh, and yeah, so but first, let's start by turning theorems into problems, just to get our, you know, the nuanced view of like a theorem versus, versus a problem. So we couldn't examine has this form that for any set X, if X is an infinite binary tree, well then there exists some set Y, which is an infinite path through X. And if you think about it, the prime ideal theorem has that same form. In general, given a, a theorem of that form, we can associate with it a problem, right? where we think of the x's which satisfy the if part as being an instance of a problem, a particular, you know, a particular version of that problem, and any y which satisfies the existential part as being a solution to that problem instance x. Okay? And just because it's nice to have shorthand, 
I'm going to let the problem W or uh, let WKL represent the problem associated with weak Koenig's lemma, and prime ideal to be the problem associated with uh, the prime ideal theorem. Okay. So a natural first question that you might have is, well, is this finding paths through trees problem? Is WKL computable? And by that I mean, is there some algorithmic, algorithmic way that given you know, a problem instance that you can actually go find and compute a path through that tree? And I'll say more what I mean by that in a bit. Well, we're gonna see together that this is not a computable problem, but that, that doesn't really tell us how hard it is. Right? So we're gonna take two approaches that are very related to each other. So the first comes from computability theory, which is what I like to call an oracle approach. It says, okay, well, you, you can't compute a solution to this problem, but, but if you could go ask an oracle you know, for some additional information, what would it take for you to actually be able to compute um, a path through a given, given tree? As part of the oracle approach, we're going to look at uh, problem reduction, which is a special, a special type of, of oracle approach, which allows us to compare problems by transforming one kind of problem, like the prime ideal problem, into, say, weak Koenig's lemma. The second approach, which is known as reverse mathematics, uh, asks, or it measures, uh, it measures the strength of theorems by asking, well, what theorems are provable from weak Koenig's lemma, say? And what other theorems can prove, prove it? And use that as a measure of strength. All right. Before we go on, though, I want to say a little bit more by what I mean by computable or non-computable. So in 1936, Alan Turing formalized what it means to compute. But we're going to rely on a useful and actually quite accurate anachronism that his model of computation really is the computer that's sitting up here on the podium that can run what are now called Turing machines. What's a Turing machine? Well, again, I'm going to tell you a Turing machine is essentially a computer program that uses natural numbers for inputs and outputs. All right. And then we can say that, say, a function from the natural numbers to the natural numbers is computable if there is some computer program out there that when run on input n, well, its computation completes, and that's also called halts, and outputs f of n. Now, I just said what a function from the natural numbers to the natural numbers means to be computable, but as long as you're dealing with a countable object that can be encoded by natural numbers, you can talk about the computability or non-computability of that object. Let's say just a bit more, though, about what I mean by a, a computer program. So a computer program, P, it's got to be a finite set of instructions written in some fixed language. Pick your favorite. I put Java. Um, and this finite set of instructions has to be such that how you get from any step to the next must be completely determined. You don't get any choices in the matter about, about how you proceed. So it's a key fact of computability theory that there is actually a computable list of all the programs in the world. And we're going to build this thing together. So what you do is you list all finite sequences of symbols used in, in Java ordered by length and lexicographically. And then I'm gonna let PI be the ith finite sequence of symbols in this list. I'm so proud of my list. Now you might be saying to yourself, this is a terrible list of programs, right? There are all these things that wouldn't even compute or compile, and I totally agree, it's a horrible list. But what's important is that any program you might actually want you know, to write will be in that list. So it's very akin to you know, having monkeys type randomly on typewriters and you get, get Shakespeare. So you get an immediate corollary of this proposition that, hey, there are non-computable functions from the natural numbers to the natural numbers. And it's purely a size argument. Well, if you're a computable function, there's a program which, which computes you. And there are only countably many of these programs. Well, how many functions are there from the natural numbers to the natural numbers? one can show that it's actually the same as the size of the reals. And the reals are uncountable, ah, oh, too many functions, some of them have to be non-computable. That's, that's a little bit disappointing, especially in a talk where we're talking about constructing things or pointing to particular examples. 
you might know some non-computable problems out there, the world, word problem in group theory or, or the resolution of um, Hilbert's 10th problem. You know, there's, there's non-computable problems that we can point to. But I like to point to one that, sadly, we all are often way too familiar with. And that is the halting problem. So I have this proclivity for liking to keep all the tabs open in my web browser. It really drives my, my partner crazy. And then, you know, I'm teching this talk, right? And I get the spinning wheel of death, OK? And you have to decide, do I, how much longer do I wait before I stop this, you know, before I force quit Chrome on my computer, or even worse, have to you know, restart the computer? Or that maybe it just needed two more seconds. So that's, that is the halting problem. But I said we want a particular non-computable function, so let's formalize this a little bit more. Okay. So the halting problem asks, if program I in our list of programs is run on input N, well, does the computation halt? All right. Well, we can encode a solution to the halting problem by a function from the natural numbers to the natural numbers, okay, where, well, first, the inputs to this, we're gonna take a pair of numbers, i for our program index, and n our input, and we're gonna code that as a single natural number, and there's nice computable ways to do that. And then this function, given, given that paired, paired number, is gonna output a one if the program pi run on input n, in fact, does, does halt eventually. Does there exist some step S such that program PI uh, run on this input halts in S steps, okay? And otherwise, this function's gonna output a, put a zero. So it's not too hard to show that this function is not computable. And let me tell you how, and then if you get bored in hopefully not this talk, but maybe another talk, that you can think about how to, how to show this. Right. Well, what you're gonna do is proof by contradiction. Suppose that you have this function and that it's computable, that you know this information, then you're going to try and reach a contradiction by doing a diagonalization argument. Oh, we have a list of programs to diagonalize. Fantastic. So what you're going to do is you're going to try and construct a program using the fact that you believe the halting problem is computable that diagonalizes out of, out of that list, okay? So notice that's the same way, essentially, that you prove that there are uncountably many real numbers, right? So it's, it's really sort of the same idea as our, as our cardinality argument before. Right? So this is a not computable problem that, that unfortunately plagues us every day. Right. So let's return now to our test case of, of weak Koenig's lemma. And what I first want to do is, is fix really what this theorem says um, before we continue. So this, this theorem's about trees, but it's not trees that grow out of the ground, it's trees more akin to family trees. Right? So what's a tree? Well, here's an example of one, okay? I like to grow mine downwards. I know that's, that's very debatable what you do. So a binary tree is going to be a set of finite sequences of zeros and ones, and I'll call those nodes on my tree, okay? And they have this additional property that Hey, if you've got a node on your tree, say 110, well then any prefix of it, like 11, sorry, 1100, any prefix of it, like 110 or 11, also has to be an element of the tree, all right? So any prefix of something in the tree has to also be an element. So this closed under prefixes is, is what makes you, um, turns you into a tree, all right? Okay, well, What's a, what's a path, or an, and whenever I say the word path, I actually mean infinite path, I'll try to say it, but sometimes I forget. An infinite path through my tree is going to be an infinite sequence of f, of zeros and ones, all right, such that any finite prefix of it is in the tree. So for example, this path f, is, this infinite path, is going to be a path through my tree because if I take any initial prefix of it, say zero, one, right, zero, one is on the tree or zero, one, zero, that's on the tree. And then you kind of have to imagine, here's the problem of, of Beamer, it doesn't let me have infinitely main nodes on my page, but you have to imagine that, that all of these initial prefixes actually are, are on my tree, okay? So notice, if your tree has an infinite path, that tells you that this tree will be infinite, because there's infinitely many prefixes, okay? 
So you can think about Wee Cunning's lemma as the converse of that. It's saying that if you have an infinite tree, well then in fact it will have an infinite path through it. So let's, let's prove this theorem together. It's, it's, it's a, a nice, um, simple theorem to prove. So what we're gonna do is, well, how are you gonna build a path? It's natural to start up at what people call the root and then just build it sort of step by step. So how are you gonna decide whether to go left towards zero or right towards one? Well, the only danger would sort of be that maybe there aren't infinitely many nodes to actually grow into an infinite path. All right, you certainly wouldn't want to go anywhere there's only finitely many nodes. So we're gonna ask that question. We're gonna say, okay, are there infinitely many nodes below zero or are there infinitely many nodes below one? There has to be infinitely many nodes somewhere because this tree is infinite and so they gotta go somewhere. All right, so let's say that I see that there's infinitely many going to the left and finitely many going to the right. Well then clearly I'm gonna start my tree with a zero in this, in this direction and then I repeat. I say, okay, infinitely many nodes below um, zero, zero, or infinitely many nodes below uh, zero, one. And again, if now in the one direction, the right direction is infinite and finite in the, in the left direction, well then, I'm gonna continue with a one. And repeat. Now of course, what might happen is, I might get lucky and I might be able to go either way. Great, then I can continue any, any direction that I want and then you can just recursively continue to build an infant path through this tree, okay? So we've seen how to prove Lee Koenig's lemma, right, just classically prove it. But now let's turn to thinking about whether this is a computable problem or not. Well, what does that mean exactly? That means if I'm handed a computable infinite binary tree, and I'll say what that is in a moment, is there actually a computable infinite path through it? So a tree is, so what do I mean by a tree being computable? Well, that means that there's going to be some computer program that if you give me, you know, if, if given some L, some length L, this computer program can tell me all the nodes of length less than or equal to L, okay? Basically, it can tell me what does this tree look like up through level L. And computing an infinite path uh, F of this tree means that, well, is there again a program that can algorithmically tell me what the S digit of it is for any S? So I give it S, it says zero or one, okay? Well, I already told you that this isn't a computable problem. I guess I'm like Tony, I don't like surprises, didn't want to surprise anybody. But let's sort of intuitively think about why, why you know, if there is, it's not computable. Well, let's imagine that Russell hands me some computable tree, so he gives me the program, and I'm supposed to find an infinite path through it. Well, what am I naturally gonna do? Maybe I'll draw some of the tree. Maybe I draw the first three levels of the tree. Okay, and my program can do that for me. And then I have to make a decision at some point about, like, am I gonna go towards, you know, in, towards the, uh, the left or to the right? It's clear I'm not gonna go towards zero, zero. That's obviously a bad idea, but, it's unclear whether I should go to one, one, or say zero, one, because I don't know if there might not be any more you know, nodes below here, okay? Or even maybe a long way down below there that might happen. So the issue is that potential paths can sort of die off later than you can see them in a computable way. So let's take this intuition and actually turn it into a, a real uh, counterexample. So let's together build a computable infinite tree which has no computable infinite path. So the easy part, I promise, is building the tree computably. What we're gonna do is we're gonna describe an algorithm that at stage S tells us what the tree looks like through level S, okay? And we're gonna make sure that this tree is actually infinite. Sometimes that's easy to forget. And we're gonna do that by making sure that there's a node on each level of the tree. The hard part is preventing computable paths to sneak into our tree. But, again, we're gonna use our list, right? Any computable path would have a program computing it. So we're essentially going to do a diagonalization argument to, to accomplish this hard part, okay? So as part of our construction, we're gonna make sure that we satisfy these requirements, 
all right, that for each program PI on the list, if program P starts, you know, it's computing an infinite sequence of zeros and ones, well then we're gonna make sure that this thing isn't a path on our tree. There's gonna be some prefix which is not on, on our tree T, okay? So let's see how to, how to make this happen. What we're gonna do is, we're gonna have a strategy for defeating each program individually, P0, P1, P2. So rather than, you know, they really don't interact that much with each other, so I'm gonna talk about defeating P0 on its own and then we'll extrapolate from there. So what we're gonna do is we have to start con building, constructing our tree. So we're gonna start building our tree as the full binary tree, which if you think about what we're trying to accomplish seems like a terrible idea, but, but, uh, but leaving that for a moment. Let's suppose that P0 eventually computes the first digit of its potential path F0. Let's say that it starts its potential path with a zero. Well, we've been happily building our full binary tree and let's imagine that I got to level two by the time that P0 said, hey, I'm gonna start with a zero, all right? Now, if P0 never tells me anything, that's fine because it means that it's not actually computing a path, right? It would have to at some point start, you know, tell me the first digit if it, if it really was a com computing a path. Well, then I can't change any of what I've already built, right? That wouldn't be, you know, we've already built it. But what I can do is I can promise not to build any more nodes that extend zero. And so that's precisely what we're gonna do, okay? So we're just gonna make sure that we don't build below this node, uh, you know, any, or build any more nodes extending zero. And then that keeps F0 from being a path of our tree. Well then we're gonna keep building our tree until P1 computes the first two digits of its potential path and repeat, make sure that we just stop growing um, nodes which extend those first two digits, and so on. Your first job is to check that our tree is still infinite, <laughs> that we actually have an infinite tree, and that we didn't accidentally you know, cut off all the nodes, all right? So check that these strategies will, will mesh together to ensure that at least one node exists at each level of, of this tree. The other thing, though, that I should say is, just to make the exposition a little bit simpler, I, I'm fudging a bit. Right, P1 might compute its first two digits before you see P0 compute anything. So you do sort of have to dovetail your computations and watch, you know, sort of watch your strategies a bit simultaneously. Um, and that's another, another important feature to, to doing computability. You can't, you sort of have to work on all the pieces simultaneously. But one, one can do that. Okay, so we, first we proved that weak Kernig's lemma is true. But we just saw that the theorem falls apart from a computable perspective, all right? And so this is an old, old theorem of Kreisel that, hey, there is this infinite computable tree with no computable path. But that doesn't really tell us how difficult this mathematical problem is. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start to take our oracle approach, right? Russell said that I had two advisors, which I highly recommend for people thinking about how many advisors they have. More is better as long as they like each other. Um, and uh, my Robert Sor would often say to me, well, go consult the oracle when we would get stuck on something, the oracle being Dennis Hirschfeld. Um, but in general, you know, we're gonna try and say, well, what additional information could we take to the oracle if, we need to com you know, if we're trying to compute weak Kernig's lemma? So it turns out that the halting problem is a good oracle for solving the weak Kernig's lemma. And I'm gonna use this notation, this is just my notation for the talk of sort of information, you know, uh, less than or equal, to say that the halting problem can be used as an oracle to solve instances of weak Kernig's lemma, okay? Well, let's see why. Well, remember, when we proved weak Kernig's lemma, just, you know, when we proved it, it was actually pretty constructive of a proof. We were saying, how do you figure out what the digits in this infinite path should be? The only thing that was non-constructive was we were asking the question, hey, are there infinitely many nodes below zero or infinitely many nodes below one, right? So let's see how the halting problem can answer that question for us. And I'm specifically gonna focus on, um, hey, is it a bad idea to go towards zero, okay? So we're gonna use the halting problem to answer whether there exists a level L, right, extend it, you know, um, such that there are no level nodes extending zero on tree. 
i.e., is it a terrible idea to start our path with a zero, okay, and then go the other way, right? So that would sort of mean that there's like an area where, well, nothing left on, uh, at that level, so you don't want to start your path with a zero. So how do you use the halting problem to answer this question? Well, what I can do is I can write a program that goes and starts to search for such a level, right? I know what you know, the tree looks like at any given level. There's only finitely many levels at any given level L, extending zero. And I'm going to ask my, ask my um, you know, tr computable tree, hey, do I even, are any of those nodes on this tree? Well, my program goes searching for such a level, but if it can't find one, it would just keep, keep running, right? It wouldn't halt. Ah, but the halting problem can know, can tell me, whether my program that I just wrote will actually find a level where there are no, you know, no nodes extending zero. Right? It, can, it can answer that question for me. So that tells us that the halting problem is at least as hard of a problem as weak Kernig's lemma. And in fact, it's actually strictly harder. I'm not gonna prove why, but I'm gonna give you some intuition why the halting problem is a harder problem than weak Kernig's lemma. The halting problem, if you present it with a computable tree, it can answer at any node and say whether there are infinitely many nodes below that given node. Any place in the tree it can answer. Well, if I had, if I had a solution to weak Kernig's lemma, that would give me an infinite path through the tree. But that would only tell me whether there are infinitely many nodes below any node on that path. Off the path, who knows what's going on, okay? So that sort of gives you a little bit of flavor of why the halting problem knows more than solutions to, than being able to solve weak Kernig's lemma. Weak Kernig's lemma only tells you information along, along a path in some sense. Okay, so we've seen that the weak Kernig's lemma is a non-computable problem, so it's strictly non-computable, but that the halting problem is a strictly harder problem in this oracle sense than, than um, weak Kernig's lemma. I can tell you that you can build a, a counterexample for the prime ideal theorem, that, that it's not computable. So a natural question is say, well, how does it hard compare to weak Kernig's lemma or to the halting problem? Okay. So I'm gonna tell you again, ruin the surprise, that the prime ideal problem is no harder than weak Kernig's lemma in this oracle information sense. And we're actually gonna see that it's even better than just saying that it's no harder than weak Kernig's lemma. It's no harder in a very particular way. But before we do that, let's think of, let's, I just wanna make sure that we, we remember this theorem and think about what goes into it. So the prime ideal theorem says that every countably infinite commutative ring has a prime ideal. And if you're paying very close attention, you'll notice I slipped in this countably infinite. I didn't have that before, okay? But I'm gonna, we're really interested in, the, in this version of the theorem because we're doing computability, and computability plays very nicely with countable things, things that can be encoded by natural numbers. So this is really the theorem that we're looking at. People have you know, thought about how to, how to deal with the uncountable, but um, we won't do that to, today. So all right, so what is a prime ideal? Just to remind us, and because we wanna think about it in sort of a computability way, well, it's a subset P of a computable ring R, and it's gonna have the additive identity zero in it, but not the multiplicative identity, because that would, by the ideal property, would turn it into the whole, whole ring. It's got additive closure, so the sum of any two elements of the ideal is in the ideal. Then you have the ideal property, that if, you have a, if um, either of two elements is in the ideal, then the product will be in their ideal. And then sort of the dual of that is the prime property that if you have a product in the ideal, one or the other um, elements of that, that product has to be in the ideal, okay? All right. So let's see how weak Kernig's lemma can be used to solve the prime ideal problem. And it's gonna be used to solve it in a very nice way. We're actually gonna literally transform instances of the prime ideal problem into weak Kernig's lemma to solve it. So specifically, we're going to take our ring R and we're going to apply a computable transformation to that to get us a, a, a an infinite binary tree T sub R so that any path F of that tree can itself be computably transformed 
into a prime ideal for that ring. Right? So I'm going to say use this transformation less or equal to say when you can do that. Notice that's a stricter sense than, you know, that's telling you more information than can you use this problem as an oracle to solve this one. So it, so it certainly implies that oracle, oracle mean. This kind of problem transformation, if you're familiar with the P versus NP kind of problem, it's the same setup for what you would use to show a problem's NP complete um, or the like, except for there your, tr your transformations would have to be uh, polynomial time reducible. Okay. So it's, it's literally the same thing. Okay. Before we do this, though, we have to think about how the ring is handed to us, right? We're going to be sort of handed a ring in some algorithmic fashion. Well, what does that exactly mean? Well, it means that there's, we're going to be handed an indexing of the elements of R. So those will be my A sub I, such that I is indexed by the natural numbers. We may as well assume that A0 is the additive identity 0, and A sub 1 is the additive identity 1, just because it's convenient and easier to remember. But then, once you have an indexing, your ring operations plus in time induce functions on the indices. Okay? I'm not actually going to use the definition of these functions on the indices, but how you should think about these functions on the indices is basically that, hey, you know, they encode whether AI plus AJ is equal to AK, right? And same for multiplication. So a presentation of a ring, um, is, or an encoding of a ring is such an, in, an indexing together with these functions which tell you how addition and multiplication work on, on the indices. A presentation is computable if, well, those functions that tell you how the operations work are in fact, are in fact computable. So how you should think about this is if you are handed a presentation of a ring, what you can do is that you've got a computer program that will tell you, hey, you're like, hey, does A1 plus A2 equal A5? Hey, I can ask my computer to compute yes or no whether that's true. That's, that's really what you should take away from an encoding. Okay, let's get to the fun part and do this transformation. So we're trying to construct a tree, T sub R, so that we can compute a prime ideal from any path through that tree. So what we're going to do is we're going to view nodes as partial characteristic functions for what elements are in, in P. So what we're going to do is we're going to decode finite sequences of zeros and ones in the following way. First, write down the elements you know, in order below, below the, uh, you know, before the, below the zeros and ones. And then one being above A0 is going to mean in our heads that A0 is an element of P. And a zero above A1 is going to mean that A, A1 is not in P. And a one above A2 is going to mean that A2 is in P. So that's how you, how you decode those nodes. So in general, our old view of, of trees, or how, how you'd actually write them down, now has this semantic meaning attached to it. So notice that basically what's going on is that at this first level, you're deciding whether A0 is out of the prime ideal, read for out, or A sub zero is in the prime ideal. And at this next level, well, you're still recording what happened to A zero, but what's new is that you're saying, hey, is A sub one out or is A sub one in the prime ideal? Okay. Now, we want the, what nodes we put on the tree to correspond to potential prime ideals. So we can't just throw on any old nodes. So what nodes can be in our tree well, remember that a sub zero is the additive identity and a sub one is one. Well, by the prime ideal properties, we need to have a zero being in P and a sub one not being in P. So that tells us that we must have a zero in, a one out as a node in our tree, but we don't want to have nodes like a zero out, a one out, okay? So that actually completely determines what nodes will be in the first two levels of this tree. So in the, in the uh, just zero one version, it's this, but in the you know, semantic meaning version, it'll look like this. From here on out, I have trouble just with the zeros and ones, so I'm just gonna do the semantic meaning about what we really, really mean for the trees. But we had many other properties about what goes into being a prime ideal, so we're gonna have to respect those as well. So for a moment, let me be an oracle for us. 
And let's imagine that I know that uh, the first arithmetic relationship between A2 and um, between, sorry, A0 through A4 is the relationship that A2 is equal to A3 times A4. I just tell us all that. Well then, we know that the ideal properties that we need to respect, or prime ideal properties, are going to tell us that, well, if A3 or A4 is in, in the ideal, well then A2 is gonna have to be in the deal. And the prime property is gonna say that if A2 is in the prime ideal, well then either A3 or A4 have to be in. So let's see how that plays out with what nodes we wanna put on the tree. Also, I'm gonna assume that all my nodes extend those A0, A, you know, the A0 in, A1 out, just to make the nodes a little less complicated. So imagine that that information is just hidden for the moment. Okay, well the other thing though that I as an oracle was telling us that this was the first relationship between A0 through A4. We're trying to build this tree computably so we don't get to just ask the oracle about that information. Instead, what we're going to do is at each level of the tree, we're going to compute what arithmetic relationships exist between the elements up through the level that we're interested in. So this is kind of the A2 level, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, between, you know, ask our computer program, what, what, uh, what relationships, arithmetic relationships exist between A0, A1, and A2? There are only finitely many of those, so we can ask our computer program to compute all of those. And then we'll sort of imagine that we're able to see those at this level. At the A3 level, we'll ask for all, we'll compute all the arithmetic relationships through, from A0 through A3. At the A4 level, we'll compute our arithmetic relationships, and then we see this is one of them, okay? So it's not until we're at this level of the tree that we computably see that we're going to have to make sure our nodes respect these rules. So how, how does that play out? Well, we, at, at the A2 level, we have a choice about whether A2 goes out or goes in. Let's imagine that we're gonna pay attention to when A2 is out. Then at the A3 level, we again have a choice because we don't see any relationship yet. But at the A4 level, ah, we have to respect this relationship. So then I'm not gonna add the node here below which has the A4 is in because that would not respect this relationship since A2 is out on, on the nodes below, below A2 being out. Similarly, I'd written down the, the node A2 in, out, A3 in, well, I'm just not gonna grow that node any farther because this node already disrespects this relationship, but I didn't see it until I got to here. Okay. The primite property um, kicks in, you can see that on the other side. If we put in A2, well then certainly we're gonna have to make sure at the A4 level that one of A3 or A4 is in the prime ideal, is colored blue, okay? So that's why this node here, which would have corresponded to A2 in, but A3 and A4 out isn't on the tree because it doesn't respect, respect this property, okay. So that's how we're actually gonna define what nodes are in the tree. For completeness and to be like, ah, you know, too much information on slide, here's, here's actually the definition of our tree. Sigma is a node on this tree, T sub r, if its encoding states that for, well, up to the elements, um, you know, of that length, you're indexed by the length of sigma, does this node respect the prime ideal properties that we listed out, all right? That is, hopefully the example sort of motivate, a computable check. Sigma is a, compu is a finite node, and we can sort of check up to those, those um, finitely many elements, hey, are we respecting these conditions, um, uh, you know, based on, based on the arithmetic relations that we can see so far. The other thing I should say, besides that this tree is computable, is that we know a prime ideal exists for R classically. So that means, that means that there is some infinite path through this tree. That ideal will correspond to an infinite path through this tree, which will tell us that this tree is in fact infinite. 
because we can't apply weaker Lem unless you have the theorem statement. It's always sad when you get that far and there's nothing there. Okay, so now we've seen how to transform instances of the prime ideal problem into weak instances of the weak Koenig's lemma problem. So that given a path through this tree T sub R, well you can compute a prime ideal of R by just reading off what, what elements on that path the, the, the path says are in, are colored blue, or if you're fully decoding that the, the path indicates a one form, says it's in. Okay. All right, so what we've seen is we just saw how to, uh, how to transform the prime ideal problem into weak Koenig's lemma. And we'd already discussed how that's sort of an even better form of knowing that weak Koenig's lemma can serve as an, as an oracle to solve the prime ideal problem. But these related approaches not only calibrate computational hardness and sort of tell us what's going on with these problems at sort of a combinatorial level, but they're also intimately tied to foundational questions. Specifically, after the, after the set theoretic revolution in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and sort of the foundational crisis of mathematics, mathematicians spent a lot of time worrying about, well, what are the right axioms for mathematics? In particular, they were thinking about what sets should we believe to exist? And after a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, you know, we've, we've come to agree that the set existence set existence axiom collection, ZFC, is a reasonable basis for most, um, if not all, of, of mathematics. But a lot of the everyday mathematics, or, or in quote, ordinary mathematics that we do, really doesn't need the full power of ZFC. Okay? So Simpson, Steve Simpson, in his seminal book on reverse mathematics, defines ordinary mathematics as, well, countable mathematics or essentially mathematics that can be understood via countable approximations. And in particular, he had in mind um, uh, countable complete, or sorry, complete separable metric spaces. So, so think about the real numbers and functions on the real numbers. The real numbers have the rationals as a countable dense sub subset. And if you understand what's going on on the rationals, well then you really can approximate well what's going on with the real numbers and functions on the real numbers. So he would, he would count that um, as sort of ordinary mathematics right, in this sense. So the big, the big question of reverse mathematics, this, this second approach that I'm gonna talk more briefly about, is say that you take a theorem of ordinary mathematics. Well then what axioms so what minimal collection of axioms suffice to prove that theorem? Okay. And so this, this, uh, this, this question of or, or this program of reverse mathematics was introduced by Harvey Friedman in 1974 and really brought forward by, by Steve Simpson. Um, but now many, many people, this is your know, work in this field, it's grown into a whole subfield of, of logic it, itself. So if you're gonna approach this question of, well, what axioms are gonna to suffice to prove your, your everyday, your ordinary theorem? Well, you're gonna to have to work in a formal system of proof. Right? And what you're gonna do is you're gonna work over a very weak collection of, of axioms. Um, the one that's usually used is called RCA naught. Right? And the weak, they're gonna be weak in the sense that they're supposed to be axioms that we kinda of all believe are definitely true. Everybody's like, yeah, 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 that should really be true. All right, they're not supposed to have a lot of power. How you should think about RCA naught is that it asserts essentially that computable sets exist. Because if you're gonna believe any sets exist, well then what you can compute should probably exist. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna compare our theorem to various benchmark axiom collections. And we're gonna try and find the weakest collection of axioms which proves the theorem we're interested in. By weakest, that's going to be the one which over our very weak collection of axioms, RCA naught, well, one where then you can actually use the theorem itself to prove the remaining axioms in the collection. So doing this last step is called proving a reversal, all right? And that's where the name reverse mathematics comes from, okay? Well, where did, I mean, the benchmark systems, they had to come from somewhere. So the early era of reverse mathematics was trying to figure out what are sort of good benchmark axiom collections to use. And after a lot of work, people noticed that, hey, these 
these five collections of axioms seem to be equivalent to a lot of everyday mathematics. And so here, here are what uh, Steve Simpson called the big five, okay? These are benchmark axiom systems. We talked about RCA0, which says that computable sets exist. WKL0, hey, that should look familiar, is RCA0 together with the statement that every infinite binary tree has an infinite path. ACA0 is again, you take all of RCA0 and you add in the statement, the halting problem has a solution. There are two other, two other uh, collect, axioms collections which are uh, stronger, but since we're not gonna address those, I'm just not gonna say what they are, okay? And one can, I sort of alluded to this, one can show that in this proof theoretic sense, WKL0 is in fact stronger of an axiom collection than RCA0, and similarly that ACA0 is stronger than WKL0. Well, that probably doesn't look too surprising given what we've seen um, you know, with our computable work, right? We already had seen that the halting problem was strictly stronger than, than the weak kernel zilma problem, which itself wasn't computable. And I should say, the reasons that we saw these relationships, these information um, theoretic inequalities, are really honestly what's at the heart of this relationship, okay? I do want to emphasize that the proof theoretic strength, that sort of proof theoretic strength versus um, information theoretic strength are not, this, they, neither of those imply each other. There are sort of subtle differences between the two. But what we're seeing here, what we discussed here really is an honest version of what's really going on between those, between those uh, systems. Right. Moreover, Friedman, Simpson, and Smith showed that weak Koenig's lemma, or that WKL0, in fact proves the prime ideal theorem, okay? And what they did is they actually, within the formal system of weak Koenig's, of WKL0, they, they enacted the, the uh, problem transformation that we did together, all right? So, so you sort of know what the main ideas of that proof is. But it gets even better. If you assume RCA0, you can use the prime ideal theorem to prove weak Koenig's lemma. So what that's telling you is that weak Koenig's lemma is really the same thing in a different guise as the prime ideal theorem, okay, up to RCA0. And that's, that's important not just because it's interesting, but that's saying that if you're trying to give the easiest proof of the prime ideal theorem, well then you really, at its heart, it has to involve this weak Koenig's lemma, you know, combinatorial principle in some sense. And so that's where this can be powerful for mathematicians outside of logic, besides, besides being interested. Is this really a necessary approach um, to doing this proof as easily as possible? Okay, I mentioned that WKL0 is one of the big five, so there's lots of mathematical principles which are proof theoretically the same as it. So I, I just listed a few, you know, from calculus, any continuous real valued function on, on the closed interval 0, 1 is Riemann integrable. Eh, it's the same. Uh, my favorite is the heine borel covering lemma. Um, this can be generalized. I was just trying to write it in the simplest way possible here. Um, but but uh, that says that any cover of the open interval 0, 1 by open intervals has a finite subcover. So this is really, can be, you know, it's really a compactness statement and, and you can make more general versions of the statement um, to be a proof theoretically equivalent to weak Koenig's lemma or to WKL0. There are also examples from logic. Even a model theoretic principle that I studied in my thesis turns out to be equivalent to WKL0. So there are lots of things uh, equivalent to this. Here again is the, the big five. And now I've listed them from weakest to strongest, and they really are in a line like that. And as I said the earlier, I was seeing that these five systems really encompass a lot of the everyday mathematics that we did. That, that you know, much of mathematics would, would be equivalent to one of these principles of, of everyday mathematics. Well, as a test of sort of the robustness of this, these systems, people became interested in principles that are not proof theoretically equivalent to one of these five. So the picture more or less today is, is much more complicated. Okay, so if you're looking at AC0 and below, or almost AC0 and below, this is a fairly recent picture of, of what's known, and I blew up for you RCA0 tiding down here, and WKL0 there, just because it's hard to draw. 
uh, and AC knots up, up, up there. Okay. And, uh, and so Demir Jafarov calls this the reverse mathematics zoo, as in the zoo of principles, the wildness of mathematics um, that's out there. And he and, and various colleagues put together an amazing computer program that draws these diagrams, uh, which is wonderful. Um, but in particular, I wanted to highlight a principle that's played a huge role um, in the development of reverse mathematics, and that's a principle called RT22. And so RT22 is an infinite version of Ramsey's theorem. Um, what you do is you take pairs of natural numbers and then you can color them by, by you color the pairs um, by two colors. And then the principle says that, hey, there will be an infinite subset of the natural numbers which all, all, all pairs of those will be the same color. And so just to give you an example of how these things go, in 1995, Cetapin was able to show that RT22 was actually strictly weaker than ac -NOM. And then, you know, souping up a lot of techniques, uh, Cholak, jo uh, Cholak, Jokish, and Slayman showed that WKL not cannot, in fact, prove RT22. Okay. And then uh, the relative, you know, um, newcomer unknown was able to show that RT22, sorry for highlighting everything, um, that RT22 is not strong enough to prove weak Kernig's lemma. So that these two things are, those two systems are actually completely incomparable to one another. Um, um, in, that, in that sense. Okay. Oops, wrong thing. Oh dear. I'm sorry, I pushed the button accidentally. Maybe I should. Oh no. I pushed the button on the computer and now I don't know how to uh, advance the slide. <laughs> so maybe while people can, uh, is it good? Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so what do I hope you take away from this talk? Well, first off, I hope that uh, you view your problems with, um, you know, in a new way. In particular, that this computable perspective is very different from an existential one. He fixed it, um, and uh, no problem. And uh, but that that it's much richer than just a computable non-computable dichotomy. That these two approaches, um, you know, these approaches of computable and reverse mathematics can really not just tell you the difficulty of these problems, but that they actually tell you really what's at the core, core of them, at their combinatorial core, what makes these problems tick. Right. So here are, here are just some further reading. In particular, I wanna highlight John Stilwell's um, book on reverse mathematics. It's aimed at sort of the advanced undergraduate level. It, it doesn't assume any background. And then lastly, I again want to invite you all to the special session, Logic Facing Outward, um, that, that Russell and I are organizing. So in this session, the talks will highlight specific applications of logic to other areas of mathematics. And the speakers are not going to assume any particular logic background. So that's this afternoon and, and tomorrow morning. And as you can see, we have talks of all different varieties. So I hope that we uh, have something, something for everyone. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have time for maybe one or two questions. If you have them, there are microphones in each aisle, each of the center three aisles fairly far forward. Please come up and speak into a microphone if you have a question. Hello. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the talk. It was uh, mind blowing. Um, I have a question about the shape of uh, Chrysler's theorem, if that's okay. The shape of what? Theorem? The shape of Chrysler's theorem. Oh. That Let me bring it back. Oh, I touched the slide thing again. <laughs> it's very dangerous. Yes, this, ah, this theorem. This one? Right, yeah. Okay, uh, so. So it seems like, okay, if we say that like T is, is the statement that there is, a, there is a computable tree that has no computable path, right? And so we have, of course, T implies not K. We say K is uh, the uh, weak Koenig's lemma, right? So um, if there's a tree, then Koenig's lemma is not true. And uh, Chrysler's construction shows that if K is true, then we can get such a T. 
right? Sorry, sorry. So what's what's K again? I'm sorry. So, sorry, K. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Is, is uh, Weeks Koenig's lemma? Sorry. Oh. So if Weeks Koenig's lemma is true, then we can get such a tree. Well, Weeks Weeks Koenig's lemma says that you can get a path. Right, right, right. Yeah. But we use the uh, the function that computes the path in order to compute the tree in the diagonalization argument. Oh, oh, yes. So we're we're actually not using. Well, so yeah, say your question, sorry. Right, right, right. So it seems like, so the theorem statement is that there's an infinite computable binary tree, but it seems like we're using law of excluded middle to get that, uh, to construct that infinite computable binary tree. So would that mean that the infinite computable binary tree is not computable, right? So, so the, go ahead. Uh, so, so first off, I should say, I totally believe in and use the law of the exclude middle, that, that, uh, that I'm that kind of logician. But, Actually, what we're using to build our tree isn't a path. What we're really using is that list of computable programs, or sorry, a list of all the programs out there. That's, so if we actually use the, the path through it, you're right, we'd be in trouble. So that's why it's so crucial that we have that list of, of um, you know, theorems. But I might, I might not be understanding your question correctly. No, 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 that makes perfect sense. Thank you. I see where my misunderstanding was. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks. <laughs> With that, I think we'll bring this to a close and thank Karen once again.